Finally, another AMC. And oh man, I would be lying if I told you that I was not excited to share this one. 1961 AMC Rambler Classic Cross Country Wagon. Psst, we get to drive this one. But before getting into all of it, I am Jay. Welcome to What It's Like. This channel, we feature the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars that are off the beaten path. We dive in deep. We give specs and period correct ads as well as perspectives and perceptions that other channels simply don't show. If that sounds of interest to you, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. If you'd like to get in touch with me, two ways are the best ways. Leave a comment in the comment section. I read and answer all comments posted. The second way is, is we have a Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. There's no obligation to join, but if you're interested in that, please check it out. The link will be in the description. Be sure to hit that like button too so more people can see this video in the future. Before getting into this one, a bit of background. For those who may have never heard of AMC, American Motors Corporation is what AMC stood for, founded May 1st, 1954, when two car companies, Nash and Hudson, merged. It's important to note that Nash and Hudson still had their names on cars until 1957, when both of their nameplates were retired. AMC went all in on the Rambler brand for 1958. 1958, for those that don't know, was a giant recession. And I guess it was equivalent to 2009. Nobody had money for cars because everything, and there was a big inflation and, and it was a huge economic recession. Anyway, AMC was a very conservative company in a sense that they made economy cars, cars that got better gas mileage. And a lot of their offerings was, they were a lot smaller than full-size cars. And this actually paid off in their favor because by 1961, they dethroned Plymouth in the third spot. They were part of the big three. I want you to think about that for a second. Instead of it being Ford, Chevy, and Plymouth, they were third. Let me reiterate that real quick. So American Motors was top three in American automotive production by 1961. Let's talk 1961 American Motors model lineup. American Motors was offered in three different flavors. The Rambler American, the Rambler Classic, and at the top was the Ambassador. Both the Rambler American and the Rambler Classic can be considered junior series models, and the Ambassador was considered a senior series. Rambler was renamed Classic for 1961, replacing the two existing names, Six and Rebel V8, which both names were retired at the end of the 1960 model year. And the reason, or the thought process, was for better individual model identity. Classic received a all-new front-end design featuring a one-piece rectangular extruded aluminum grille with Rambler written on the bottom, just above the bumper. Parking lights and turn signal indicators were relocated below the front bumper. Bumpers, both front and rear, were redesigned as well as all new side trim. The classic could be had as a four-door sedan and as a four-door wagon. Wagons had two configurations, either in six-passenger or nine-passenger form. If you got the nine-passenger wagon, it had a totally different tailgate that opened like a rear hinge door as opposed to having a tailgate to climb over. Classic could be had in three trim levels. Deluxe was in the basement. Standard equipment included turn signals, twin panel ashtrays, that's two ashtrays in the dashboard in the front, air cleaner, door mounted armrests in the front only, cigar lighters, dual headlamps, dual sun visors, travel rack, five black tube tires, the price was $2,439, which is equivalent to you spending $24,159.23 in the year 2022. Step it up to the super and you'll get all that plus dual horns, rear armrests, front foam seat cushions, rear ashtrays. Super started at $2,574, which is equivalent to you spending $25,496.46 in the year 2022. Stepping up to the custom gets you all of that and a bag of chips. No, I'm just kidding. But really, it does give you full wheel covers, electric clock, glove box light, two-tone steering wheel, carpet, and the rear vent windows. The custom started at 
$2,719, which is equivalent to you spending $26,932 in the year 2022. Let's talk specs. 187.8 inches long, 72.4 inches wide, 57 and a half inches tall. It rides a wheelbase of 108 inches, weighs 3,141 pounds. Total 1961 production. AMC production was 377,900 units. I also saw another number for 380,525 for the calendar year. What about if you want to buy this car now? So let's talk NADA. NADA has this car on the low end. Now, what is a low car? A low car is a car that could be considered a daily driver, has some cosmetic issues, might have some rips in the seats, might have some missing paint, might have some slight rust. There are cars that are below this. I mean, like things that need just about everything. That is not considered a low car. That That's not even a scalable car, really. But I just wanted to point out what a low car is. Low car is considered a daily driver. They, they have it for $16,000 for a low car and a high retail figure would be $49,700. What is considered a high dollar figure is 95 to 100 point Pebble Beach Concords car. Like perfect in just about every single measure. All right, moving on to engines, 195.6 cubic inch displacement, inline six, 3.2 liters. Before talking about the specs, let's give a bit of a background about this engine because it's older than you might know. 195.6, often referred to as just simply 196, was made from 1952 to 1965. It was originally designed as an economy engine by Nash Motors. It's also important to mention this engine started off life as a flathead design. Remember that part when I said AMC was super conservative? This is a case in point of that. Instead of retooling a whole new engine design when overhead valve became a thing, they just made a whole new head for their existing block. Crazy, but it worked and it saved AMC a ton of money, so it was a win on all fronts. 1961, AMC made a new version of the 196 available on all custom trimmed cars and optional on the deluxe and super trim. An auto industry first die cast aluminum block. It was produced from 1961 to 1964. The block was aluminum, but it used cast iron cylinder liners as well as a cast iron cylinder head. It's important to note there is a difference between the aluminum block head and the cast iron block head. They aren't interchangeable because the aluminum block head is an eighth of an inch wider than the cast iron block head and it has a different bolt pattern. So just so you're aware of that, if you found an aluminum engine but you have a cast iron block it will, or cast iron cylinder head, it will not work. Moving on to the specs of the 195.6 cubic inch displacement inline six, 3.2 liters. There are two variations of this engine outside the aluminum block variant. Starting with the first variant, 127 horsepower. It makes 180 foot pounds of torque. Bore is 3.13 inches, stroke is 4.25 inches. Compression is 8.7 to one. It features solid lifters. 0 to 60, 14.5 seconds. Theoretical top speed is 93 miles per hour and the average fuel economy, 16 miles per gallon. These are all with the three-speed manual. If you got the three-speed manual with optional overdrive, fuel economy goes up to 20 miles per gallon on the average. Moving on to the second variant, everything is the same. The bore stroke, compression, Everything like that's the same. It's 195.6 cubic inch displacement in line six. The only difference is, is it makes 138 horsepower, 185 foot pounds of torque. It has a two barrel carburetor with dual exhaust. Three speed manual. Theoretical top speed is 97 miles per hour, zero to 60, 12.8 seconds. Average fuel economy is 15.8 miles per gallon. Average, if you got the four speed or the three speed with overdrive, that's what they considered four speed. Zero to 60 is 13.2 seconds. It's crazy that it's actually slower than the three speed. And the average fuel economy gets bumped up to 20 miles per gallon. 
Classic buyers looking for a little bit more pep could opt and get a V8 250 cubic inch displacement overhead valve V8 4.1 liters. Makes 200 horsepower and 245 foot-pounds of torque. Bore of 3.5 inches, a stroke of 3.5 inches. Compression is 8.7 to 1. It featured solid valve lifters, two-barrel carburetor. If you wanted a little bit more power, you could opt for a single four barrel carburetor with dual exhaust that bumps power up to 215 horsepower, 260 foot pounds of torque. On to transmissions, three speed manual, three speed manual with optional overdrive, as well as a three speed automatic unit called the Flash O Matic. Some options, not getting into all of the options, but here's a few Flash O Matic, which was their automatic transmission, the overdrive, twin grip axle, which was like their pause attraction. Power steering, power brakes, power windows, power locks, they were called Lock-O-Matic, Solex glass, headrest, weather eye heater, self-adjusting brakes, all-seasoned air conditioning. Let's talk about styling for a minute. So check out all of these lines. Look at this line here. How it comes out like that. This almost looks like 60 Chevy, to be honest. And it comes back here goes out the back there's also another line that starts here and builds and then actually comes outward towards the back i just want to point this out real quick look at how this flares out around the uh wheel well notice it comes down here and it keeps flaring and like they didn't have to flare it out like this. The designers could have just made this straight, but the flare gives it an extra layer of texture, if you will. And it ends right here at the back wheel well. They could have went the rest of the way, but they didn't. They just, they stopped it right there. It's really cool. Gas filler cap is on the driver's side. Just check out these fins. This almost looks like a little wave, crest of a wave here coming off. They're very Buick Electra to me. That's what they look like. Coming up to the roof rack, just check that out. All of these got roof racks. And here's tie downs here. And notice the dip back up here. Do you guys know of another vehicle that has similar roof dip as this? It's a more modern car. In the comment section below if you know. So coming up to the door here, I just want to show you how these door handles work. You push up inside here like that, and that opens it. So let's talk about the door panel. Notice it's all framed in, this door is. And it's got vent windows here. You push the button to open them. And that's how they operate. Coming down here, nice armrest. Look at how this door panel is. For an economy car, it's, it's really nice. Armrest is slightly angled up this is the door handle to pull the door shut this is the door handle to get out this is the window crank for the big window it goes up like that just notice all of the textured inside here this is the door tag and notice it says single unit construction it's all welded so this is a this doesn't this car does not have a frame it's a unit body so the body and the frame are one solid piece. Coming down inside the pedal box down here, parking brake, parking brake release. That is the high beam switch. Here is a vent, clutch, brake, gas. All right. Here is over the hood impression. Here is what first person looks like. There is enough space underneath the steering wheel to slide my hand freely underneath it. Up on top here, sun visors. We got that sun visor over here, no courtesy mirrors. This one's got the compass feature as well as a nice rear view mirror. And look at the dancing Hawaiian girl, you gotta have one of those. So here's what the horn sounds like. <laughs> It's got a nice masculine horn. Here's what I look like. There's lots of headroom in the driver's seat. On to the button switches and knobs. Starting on the left-hand side, moving right. That black switch you see there, that is an aftermarket switch for the fog lights. Right next to it is for the headlights. Then there are weather eye climate controls. Two levers, 
The left selections read high temp off. The right selections read def for the defrost, air, and off. The next knob is very interesting. It says reefer, fan, heat. Moving to the instrument panel, temperature is all the way to the left, followed by a generator light. The speedometer is a very simplistic one. You're supposed to just imagine a zero after each number because this car will definitely go faster than 12 miles per hour. Anyway, odometer at the bottom. It is flanked by the left turn signal indicator as well as the right turn signal indicator. Oil pressure light, fuel gauge is off to the right hand side. The wiper is right below the right turn signal indicator. Another thing worth showing is, listen to this. The dashboard is made of metal. This is an economy car. Can you imagine an economy car nowadays with metal dashboard? It's just plastic on the outside nowadays. This, this thing is built solid. This thing has two ashtrays in the front. There's one here, and there's one over here, and there's cigarette lighters here. All right, on to glove box test. Here is our test subject. Here's my hand for reference. Here is the glove box in question. Base is in there. Just to give you a point of reference, like that, that camera fits in that glove box long ways. Like the lens is back inside there. But it so it's inside there and look, it shuts perfect. All right, I just want to show you this. This was Rambler's claim to fame and all of their cars going forward have this feature that I'm aware of. So we slid the seat all the way up that it could go and then you pull this lever here the seats will fold into a bed. The, the seat rests on these little hooks here. And it'll, it'll go down flatter if we could move the seat up just a wee bit more, but it's as far forward as we could get it at the moment. But just look at how much space you'd have up front if you wanted to recline the seats. It's not about leg room up here, it's about having this turn into a complete bed. But just look at how much space is back here now, because we moved the seat forward. Alright, coming to the rear door. The rear door is a lot like the front door, only it's in the back, and it's shaped a little differently. So check this out. I think it was called the Custom. If you got the Custom series, these opened. But it was only on the top trim model. There's no armrest back here for rear passengers. There is a door handle as well as a window crank to put down the big window, which it is down and it goes all the way down. When it comes up, that's what it looks like. And the coolest thing about Rambler is, is it's like three cranks to the top or three cranks to the bottom, which is really cool. That's how much space you have in the back. Getting in to the rear seat. This is how much space, lots of space. That's how much space that I have back here. Lots of leg room. There's actually more leg room in this than there is in a lot of cars that are full size cars. This is what I look like in the back. There's lots of headroom back here. It's very comfortable. The seats are very comfortable in this thing. I would like to go on a road trip in one of these, honestly. They're very nice, it's very comfortable. The coat hook here to hang your coat on both sides as well as the dome white in the center. Here's what the rear view looks like in the windows. And this is what the back to front view looks like. All right, coming to the back, so check this out. This is the crank for the rear window. Just like the crank to the other windows, it only takes three or about three cranks for it to go all the way to the top. But if you want to put the tailgate down, the lever is actually inside here. And it looks like that. The tailgate's actually really heavy for an economy car. But just check out how all the hinges work. That's how much space you have back here. There's a ton, ton of storage space. You could make Costco trip run in this car, no problem. 
underneath here is where the uh, spare tire is located. As you can see, that looks like a full size spare. That's how much space you have back here with the rear seats folded down. Just check that out. There's lots of space. Lots of space for activities. Tons of space. And just check out the wheel wells. That's really cool. steering wheel is uh -huh. it's great Mexican steering manual yeah. you can start out in second gear too nice I yeah I just put it in second yeah, Rick acted like it had no pep at all this is oh, cool. pretty good I love the visibility oh yeah visibility is great this thing, it's not as, I wasn't but, sure if it was going to be floaty or if it was going to be. No, it, it handles very well, I think. I'm trying to think like what, what to compare it to. It's not overly floaty, but it's not stiff either. No. It doesn't ride like a 67 Mustang. It <laughs> sort, of, sort of rides like a 1962 Plymouth Savoy, sort of. Mm. So let's talk driving experience. First off, I want to thank the owner for letting me drive this. This was a dream come true. It was better than I ever thought it would be. The clutch was light, but it was not vague, and the shifts were smooth, and it just rode really nice. It wasn't floaty. It wasn't stiff. It was somewhere in the middle. In the video, I said that it rides a lot like a Plymouth Savoy from 1962, and I still think that. It there's something about the Plymouth Savoy. It does not handle or drive like you think that it would. It's not stiff. It's not floaty. Just like this car. It's somewhere in the middle. I was really blown away by how it rode and what its road manners were. It turned really well. Everything just worked. And it kind of, I kind of really want one now. But I can't do that just yet. There's a project that I'm going to do for the channel. We're going to fill you in on the end of the year episode. Anyway, on to the pros and cons. I generally get all the pros and cons from a book from childhood that I have, the complete book of collectible cars, but this car isn't in there, so I've compiled my own list. On the positives, it gets good gas mileage, and I'd venture to say that it's the best fuel economy of any wagon from this period. They are rare. If you turned up, actually, funny story. So the owner was telling me that he took this to a car show one time and there was a fuel injection stingray. And he wasn't sure exactly what the year was. They stopped making them in 1965. Anyway, $100,000 car. He parked behind him. Nobody paid any attention to that stingray. It didn't matter. That stingray could have been purple and nobody would have stopped. Everybody was congregating to the Rambler because they're so unique looking and they're different. They're just oddball cars. It's it's just funny because, you know, you could have a $100,000 car parked next to this Rambler that cost a fraction of that car and nobody cared about the Corvette. Everybody flocked to the Rambler. And the reason is, it's very simple. The Rambler is just different. It's unique. The Corvettes are everywhere. You never see a Rambler. Anyway, seating for six or nine, very practical. 
roof rack for bigger things such as surfboards and canoes. On the cons, this thing is extremely rust prone. Parts can be hard to find, especially special trim parts or body panels. The 195.6 engines require lots of routine maintenance. Head bolts need to be tightened or retorqued with every oil change. All right, on to name that tune. I'm looking for the correct name of the band as well as song title. First person to do both correctly will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. That song was from 1961. That is your clue. Anyway, thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. I really appreciate all the support. And until next time, toodaloo!